Thanks for tuning in. I'm Shelby. And I'm Renee. And you're listening to The Creepy Burrito. The moment is finally here. I've been dropping some bits and pieces of the puzzle with our episode on Marilyn Monroe and the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. Today, we will be talking about the assassination of the 35th President of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, JFK. There's been endless amounts of movies, documentaries, books, podcasts just covering the JFK assassination. And what is even more mind-numbing is the amount of information and records related to the incident with no conclusive answer that is still over 50 years after the fact and still widely disputed amongst the masses. The President John F. Kennedy Assassination Records Collection Act of 1992 mandated that all assassination-related material be housed in a single collection in the National Archives and Records Administration. Currently contains over 5 million pages of assassination-related records, photographs, motion pictures, sound recordings, and artifacts. Five fucking million. The most recent release of information was in 2017 to 2018, containing 19,045 additional documents, and there are still documents that haven't been released to the public due to identifiable national security, law enforcement, and foreign affair concerns. The next deadline for further release of documents is October 26th of 2021. This is to give them time to re-review each of the redactions over the next three years. So all of the information related to the assassination we don't even have access to. Before we dive into the devastating details of what happened on November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas, Texas, I think it's important to lay down the groundwork of JFK's upbringing that paved the road to his presidency, as well as the history and the state of the country at the time, leading up to his assassination. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, also known as JFK or Jack, was born on May 29, 1917 in Brookline, Massachusetts. He was the second child of Joseph Kennedy Sr. and Rose Kennedy. JFK throughout his life has followed into his father's footsteps trying to live up to the family's expectations. His father, Joseph Kennedy, was well known for being a businessman and his career in politics. As a businessman, Joseph Kennedy Sr. made a large fortune as a stock market and commodity investor. During World War I, helped manage Bethlehem Steel Shipyard that was busy making war vessels, which is where he met and developed a friendship with Franklin D. Roosevelt, who at the time was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. After the war, he ventured into buying up movie theaters. He had reorganized and refinanced several Hollywood studios that were ultimately merged into RKO Studios and actually even profited from the Wall Street crash of 1929. One of the most controversial parts of his business career was his profits from the alcohol industry. His father, Patrick Kennedy, was a saloon owner in Boston who expanded to own a business importing whiskey, but also had his own political background as a Massachusetts state senator. So when the Prohibition era came around in the 1920s, some believe that Joseph Kennedy had a part in bootlegging and building connections with mobsters, but I'll leave that up to you to decide. The real money started pouring in when the Prohibition era was coming to an end in 1933. He teamed up with James Roosevelt II, who is Franklin Roosevelt's oldest son, to found Somerset Importers to import high-end Scotch whiskey and gin from the United Kingdom. So, once that Prohibition was lifted, everyone was buying it up and just getting drunk as fuck. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. (laughs) His wealth is what put him on the political map. I say this because in the 1930s, he became a leading member of the Democratic Party and Irish Catholic community. 
He donated, loaned, and raised a substantial amount of money in the campaign efforts for Franklin D. Roosevelt. So when Roosevelt came into office, it opened up new opportunities for him. In 1934, Joseph was appointed as chairman of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. And in 1937, Joseph directed the Maritime Commission. From 1938 to 1940, he actually served as the United States Ambassador of the United Kingdom. While Joseph was serving as ambassador living in London, JFK was attending Harvard, just as his father did. During the summer of his freshman year, JFK and his older brother, Joe Jr., traveled to work with his father in the American Embassy in London. They spent time traveling Europe, exploring different cultures of the Soviet Union, the Balkans, Middle East, and Germany. They returned to London on September 1st of 1939, the day Germany invaded Poland, bringing forth the beginning of World War II. This sparked JFK's interest in international affairs and government. His father, Joseph Kennedy, was weary of Britain's impending war with Germany. He made multiple attempts to meet with Adolf Hitler without the approval of the U.S. Department of State to bring about a better understanding between the United States and Germany. He made the mistake of stating democracy is finished in England, and it may be here, referring to the United States, and that Roosevelt would fall in the 1940 election. Also, during the Blitz, Joseph and his family that was living with him in London at the time had retreated to the countryside, while the British royal family, prime minister, and all other government stayed in London during the bombings. So... I guess you could say he pulled a splits during the blitz. Oh my god. <laughs> no. Or were you so impressed with yourself? I <laughs> was. I was like reading and then I was like, you know, it's funny. <laughs> he he splits during the blitz. So, when the word got back to the White House of Joseph Kennedy's actions, he was quickly recalled. Roosevelt had Joseph Kennedy give a nationwide radio speech to advocate for his re-election. And once he was re-elected, Joseph Kennedy resigned as ambassador, putting a damper on his political career and pushing that influence on his children. So it's not surprising when JFK's senior year came around at Harvard that his thesis was on why Great Britain was unprepared for war with Germany, and it was later actually turned into a book called Why England Slept. <laughs> you snooze, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> didn't think of that one, did you, Shelby? I didn't. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you might say, when you snooze, you, <laughs> you lose. You lose. During World War II, JFK and his older brother Joe Jr. joined the military. JFK initially attempted to enter into the Army Officer School, but due to his chronic lower back problems, he was disqualified. And I'm just going to take like a second here to emphasize, JFK wasn't the example of shiny health growing up. When he was 17, he had to go to the hospital, and they initially thought that he might have had leukemia, but the ultimate diagnosis was colitis. And he also had Addison's disease, which is an uh, adrenal insufficiency where it doesn't produce enough hormones. So that's why he was like so sick all the time when he was in office. And there are also rumors or people that speculate that he might have had an STI from his womanizing ways. I'm not judging, just throwing it out there. But there's pictures of him during his presidency, like, where he looks very run down or seen using crutches. This is where the famous Dr. Feelgood comes into play. And if you're thinking about Motley Crue, you're absolutely fucking correct. The song was actually written about Dr. Max Jacobson, a doctor known for his celebrity patients like JFK, Marilyn Monroe, Elvis, that were all prescribed with pet pills or amphetamines that helped combat depression or fatigue. He administered amphetamines and back ingestions of painkillers that JFK believed made him less dependent on crutches. Yes, what was that? Just fucking dependent on the fucking drug. <laughs> right? And if people talked about, like, Dr. Feelgood, Kennedy would demiss them and their accusations of him. And that's where the famous quote, I don't care if it's horse piss, it works. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah there's one thing i love it's just kennedy quotes 
fucking prime. Fucking prime. <laughs> I don't care if it's horse piss. It works. It works. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. I just had to go on that like little mini tangent the for a second horse there. Piss tangent. Mm-hmm. Just a little one. Just a little bit of piss. Little piss. But <laughs> back to where we were. JFK was able to join the United States Naval Reserve through the director of the Office of Naval Intelligence. Although he was only in the Navy for a few years, they were pretty eventful. Like, when he was commanding PT-109, which is a patrol torpedo boat, they were on a mission to block Japanese destroyers from the island. It was a dark night. Around 2 a.m. on the water, Kennedy sees a Japanese destroyer and attempted to turn to attack when their PT-109 was rammed in the side and cut in half by another destroyer, killing two of his men. He straight up asked the 10 crewmen that were remaining if they want to fight or just surrender, but that he had nothing to lose. They decided to stick it out and swam three and a half miles to another island. Meanwhile, the collision fucked up his already janky back, and he still took care of one of his badly burned shipmates, towing them through the water with a life jacket strap in his fucking teeth. Wow. To survive, Kennedy and these sailors swam island to island, trying to find water and food. Luckily, eventually, they found a small canoe, some crackers, candy, and a drum of drinkable water that was left by the Japanese on an island. And just to give you an idea of how long this went on for, so their patrol boat, it went down on the night of August 1st, and they weren't rescued until August 8th of 1943. Yikes. So, that's like a week of swimming around island to island, trying to find food and water. Eating candy. Eating candy. (laughs) And they didn't find that for a couple days. Yeah, it sucks. For his actions, he received a Navy and Marine Corps medal and a Purple Heart for his back injury. After being out for only a month after this incident, he was commanding yet another patrol torpedo boat, uh, the PT-59, was shortly promoted to lieutenant, had a successful rescue mission of 50 Marines, and then was released from active duty late 1944 due to his back injuries. He did have a competitive relationship with his older brother, Joe Jr. His father had aspirations for his older brother to become president one day and planned to run for seat in the United States House of Representatives after his own service in the Navy. But unfortunately, on August 12th, 1944, Joe Jr. Kennedy was killed while on a special high-risk mission when the plane's bombs detonated prematurely while filing over the English Channel, passing the Kennedy family dreams of the White House to JFK. With a little help from his father, there was an opening for a congressional seat in Massachusetts. His father later joked, with the money that I spent, I could have elected my chauffeur. How funny. How funny. Kennedy's political stances remained pretty much the same and upheld throughout his presidency campaign, calling for better housing for veterans, better health care, support for organized labor campaign for reasonable work hours, and the right to organize bargain and strike, campaigning for peace throughout the United Nations, and a strong opposition to the Soviet Union. JFK served three terms in the Congress, followed by two elections in the United States Senate. During his position in Congress, he focused on international affairs. With the emerging of the Cold War, JFK supported the Truman Doctrine that implied to support other nations that were threatened by Soviet communism, leading to the foundation of NATO two years later. And he also supported the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 that required communists to register with the government. In 1952, JFK, in preparation to run for Senate, was again financed by his father. But there was another family addition, his brother, Robert Kennedy, or also known as Bobby. Bobby Kennedy. So when Bobby joined the team as his campaign manager. Well, I'll tell you what, Bobby. <laughs> Within JFK's first year on Senate, he married Jacqueline Bouvier. On January 2nd, 1960, JFK announced that he was running for the Democratic presidential nomination, again, funded by his father and Bobby managing his campaign, which might not have been the only help that he had. 
If you can remember back to our episode on Jimmy Hoffa, we talked a little bit about an FBI-recorded wiretap between Chicago mobsters Sam Giacana and Johnny Roselli, that their donation to JFK's campaign had been accepted. There were allegations that the mafia used muscle and money to buy votes for Kennedy. Other allegations stated that Joseph Kennedy asked for Giacana's help over a dispute with another mobster, Frank Costello, and offered the president's ear in return. Or the possibilities of the influence from his own ties through Mr. Frank Sinatra, plus the alleged rigged primary in West Virginia and rigged Illinois Electoral College through Chicago Mayor Richard Daley that allegedly committed vote fraud. Allegedly. Allegedly. It was investigated. They say that there was no fraud. A lot of things have been investigated that they say there's nothing. I don't know. We'll leave that to you. It's fine. I'm not going into that rabbit hole right now. Some question JFK's ability to lead the country due to his age, experience, and if his Catholic religious beliefs would impair his judgment as a president. But many found him young, charming, well put together, and it definitely showed when it came down to the presidential debates against Nixon, who looked a bit disheveled. He didn't shave, he was sweating up a storm, and when Nixon tried to get him with his religious beliefs, Kennedy confidently shut that shit down. He was like, what about separation of church and state? And I've done nothing with my previous experience in the government that would warn that to be any sort of question. Mic drop. (laughs) JFK, against his brother's advisement, chose Lyndon B. Johnson, or also known as LBJ, as vice president nominee, in his hopes to gain support from the South. On January 20th, 1961, John F. Kennedy was sworn in as the 35th president of the United States. In your hands, my fellow citizens, more than mine, will rest the final success or failure of our course. Since this country was founded, each generation of Americans has been summoned to give testimony to its national loyalty. The graves of young Americans who answered the call to service surround the globe. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though in battle we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. Can we forge against these enemies a grand and global alliance, north and south, east and west, that can assure a more fruitful life for all mankind? Will you join in that historic effort? In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. 
Unlike Bobby Kennedy, you have to admit, JFK really did have a way with words. If you don't believe it, YouTube it and tell me that I'm wrong. Even to this day, his speeches, they're moving, and it gives you a glimpse into the weight of what was going on in the world at the time, because during his presidency, it was such a pivotal point in U.S. history. You had the space race, you had the fight for civil rights, you had the missile crisis, communism, the turning point in the war to bring a new era of peace, a lot of shit happening. And this is all within, he was only president for around a little over a thousand days. Yeah. When JFK took presidency, he had a full plate. In the 1960s, America's relationship with the USSR was like walking on thin ice. With the Cold War in full swing. Do you see what I did there? A little pun in there for you. You're so punny. Thank you. The constant battle between capitalism and communism was extremely intense. If you couldn't tell by his entire political career and inauguration speech, Kennedy's vision was to stop the spread of communism. So naturally, when JFK had a summit with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, it didn't go so well. They butted heads, Khrushchev didn't take JFK seriously as a world leader and called him weak. JFK proposed a treaty between Moscow and East Berlin, making it clear that any treaty interfering with the U.S. access rights in West Berlin would be an act of war. Once JFK gets home, the USSR announced their plan to sign a treaty with East Berlin, repealing any third-party occupation right in either sector of the city. Basically, a big fuck you. (laughs) Yeah. Prompting the U.S. to send troops and defense funding to the efforts in West Berlin. Shortly after the troops arrive is when the Berlin Wall goes up. Around the same time, with the support from the Soviet Union, Fidel Castro and Power of Cuba was spreading revolutionary ideas to other Latin American countries. Under President Dwight Eisenhower, the CIA began plots to get rid of Castro, and those pressures only increased when JFK came into presidency. Their plan for the Bay of Pigs invasion was to train and send in anti-Castro Cuban exiles with the hopes that using Cuban exiles would encourage the people to rise up and overthrow Castro. The Bay of Pigs invasion was known as a complete failure in the U.S. America had poor attempts to try to preserve plausible deniability of having any involvement with the Bay of Pigs invasion. An example of this would be when Castro's forces were aware of the impending attacks due to U.S. newspaper leaks that came out prior, giving them ample time to prepare. And since the U.S. wanted to keep their involvement secret, no air coverage was provided in the mission. According to CIA records, there were multiple assassination plots to take out Castro that go back to even before the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, which is where the mafia ties come into play. The CIA reached out to mob bosses like Salvatore Giacana, Johnny Roselli, Santo Traficante, since the mob was affected when Castro seized power, and shut down their hotels, casinos, and nightclubs. Plus, the Mafia had connections to the Cuban exile community that could help the CIA get poison in or an assassin to take Castro out. Some of their plans to take out Castro were pretty fucking secret agent man too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So besides the regular like food poisoning or explosions, the CIA had other plots like poisoning his cigars, his scuba diving suit, ballpoint pens, and uh, they had research on how to give them diseases like cancer or TB. Holy shit. And so what they would do is, like, the plans, it was to, like, lace his cigars or his scuba diving suit and ballpoint pens. Wow. Yeah. Yikes. Or another plan that they had was to lace his studio with LSD to ruin his public image on radio broadcasts. So that he would seem, like, delusional and fucking nuts. Oh my god. I was like, that's that's fucking next level. Diabolical. In response to the Bay of Pigs invasion and tensions rising with the USSR, the Soviet leader Khrushchev began installing nuclear missiles in Cuba. The U.S. already had nuclear missiles in Italy and Turkey in 1958 under... 
Dwight Eisenhower's presidency. On October 22, 1962, JFK televised that there would be a naval blockade on Cuba that would remain in effect until Soviets removed their missiles from Cuba. Any launching of these missiles against any nation would be regarded as an attack on the United States, resulting in a full retaliatory response on the Soviet Union. I think this might be something lost on millennials or like younger generations, is the fact that there was a real potential for a nuclear war at the time it it was imminent. Within a week, they were able to come to an agreement to end the missile crisis. The Soviets agreed to dismantle their missile sites in return The U.S. publicly promised to never invade on Cuba, and secretly, JFK agreed to withdraw the missiles from Turkey. Bringing the end to a nuclear war is part of the reason why he was so admired by the country and why everyone was so struck whenever he was assassinated. And just to give a brief overview of the state of the government at the time, after JFK became president, one of the first things he did was appoint his brother Bobby as attorney general, which for obvious reasons was pretty controversial. Bobby was only 35 at the time, which is one of the youngest in history and lacked any experience practicing law. The CIA was kind of going rogue from the government and did what they saw necessary having their own connections with the Mafia, and if you remember from our Jimmy Hoffa episode, Bobby Kennedy had his own personal vendetta during JFK's presidency to crack down on organized crime and lengthy investigations of labor unions and the Get Hoffa Squad. Not to mention the fact that's kind of playing both sides of the fence. If the Mafia did serve a part in getting JFK into office, or were used for attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro missions and then tried to imprison all of them, seems like a storm brewing. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, just painting a picture here. The director of the FBI at the time was J. Edgar Hoover, who is a complete enigma even in himself. For example, in the 1930s, he basically denied that there was any mafia or organized crime because he was pretty much being blackmailed by gangsters Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello that had photos of him doing some cough cough activities, wink wink, with his protege, FBI Deputy Director Clyde Tolson. They were both 40, he lived with his mom, they were both single, and after he died, he actually left his house to him. So, Sounds I feel like, like a little uh... forbidden love. And Hoover, he was also known for keeping a large collection of porn from films, photos, and specifically nudes of celebrities that he used for blackmail. Before the Kennedy Wonder Brothers came into office, he would bypass attorney generals and go straight to the president with whatever he wanted. But with the brother situation and Bobby being a stickler, kind of ended that joyride, which pissed off Hoover. Plus, Hoover and JFK didn't really see eye to eye either. One of the biggest issues being related to Martin Luther King Jr., Hoover was suspicious of MLK, that he was a troublemaker, and brought up allegations of communist ties. Since there were allegations of communism, JFK approved wiretaps on a trial basis of a month or so. Then Hoover took it upon himself to continue this and investigating MLK in any way he deemed worthy. In 1964, MLK received an anonymous blackmail letter urging him to commit suicide from none other than the FBI. Safe to say, Hoover was pretty racist. If you don't believe me, you can check that out for yourself. Don't get me wrong, JFK initially did shy away from the topic of civil rights and concerns with affecting his votes, but Kennedy did step in providing federal marshals to protect MLK during a dangerous situation in the South, and in 1963, finally unveiled a sweeping civil rights legislation that was enacted by Lyndon B. Johnson in JFK's memory after his assassination. Last, but not least, let's look at his vice president, LBJ. Let's not forget that LBJ was running for the 1960 presidential election against Kennedy. JFK took him in as vice president, seemingly just to secure votes in the South, because 
JFK kept him on a fairly limited short leash and kept him in check. One topic they did have obvious different views was the involvement in Vietnam. Kennedy had signed National Security Action Memorandum, or you might see it as NSAM, 263, dated October 11th, 1963, which ordered the withdrawal of a thousand military personnel by the year's end and a bulk of them out by 1965. He was shifting from such restrictive and harsh reactions to finding resolution and aligning with his speech on world peace at American University on June 10th, 1963. I have therefore chosen this time and place to discuss a topic on which ignorance too often abounds and the truth too rarely perceived. And that is the most important topic on earth, peace. What kind of a peace do I mean, and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave, or the security of the slave. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on Earth worth living, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope, and build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. I speak of peace because of the new face of war. Total war makes no sense in an age where great powers can maintain large and relatively invulnerable nuclear forces and refuse to surrender without resort to those forces. It makes no sense in an age where a single nuclear weapon contains almost 10 times the explosive force delivered by all the Allied Air Forces in the Second World War. It makes no sense in an age when the deadly poisons produced by a nuclear exchange would be carried by wind and water and soil and seed to the far corners of the globe and to generations yet unborn. Today, the expenditure of billions of dollars every year on weapons acquired for the purpose of making sure we never need them is essential to the keeping of peace. But surely the acquisition of such idle stockpiles, which can only destroy and never create is not the only, much less the most efficient, means of assuring peace. I speak of peace, therefore, as the necessary rational end of rational men. I realize the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war. LBJ disagreed with this. Following JFK's assassination, President Johnson signed the National Security Action Memorandum 273 on November 26th of 1963, reversing JFK's decision to withdraw a thousand troops and reaffirm the policy of assistance to the South Vietnamese. On November 21st, 1963, JFK began his two-day, five-city trip in Texas. This trip was in the works with the intentions of helping raise funds for the presidential campaign, gain support for his upcoming re-election in 1964, and to try to smooth over some friction that was ongoing within the Texas Democratic Party since JFK went into office and he had initially lost the Dallas election. They had planned the motorcade to pass right through downtown Dallas along Main Street since it was the traditional parade route and would allow for maximal building and crowd views To get to the trademark exit was only accessible from Elm Street, so at the end of the parade, they would turn onto Houston and make a left turn onto Elm Street so that they could go through Dealey Plaza before getting onto Stemmons Freeway. The Texas School Book Depository sits on that corner intersection of Houston and Elm Street. I'll be sharing a map because I'm literally directionally challenged. My mother always jokes saying that I am like a cat in a paper bag. I get lost very easily. I don't know what that saying means. If you guys know, tell us. Yeah. (laughs) I don't understand, but I will be sharing the map so that you can see the layout. 
This motorcade route, it, it was finalized and publicly announced days prior on November 18th. One concern going into Texas was an incident that happened a month prior in Dallas, Texas, with the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. He faced a lot of protesters and was actually booed and heckled while he was giving a speech. And after that speech, he was hit on the head with a picket sign and spit on. Oh my. Despite being in what was seemingly anti-Kennedy territories, the president was warmly welcomed at his first stops in Texas and San Antonio, Houston, and stayed overnight on October 21st at Fort Worth. The next morning, JFK spoke at Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce breakfast, then hopped onto an airplane to fly into Dallas's Love Field Airport, did some handshaking, kissing babies, you know, all of that good stuff. It was a clear and sunny day, despite raining the night before, and was a perfect day to ride with the top down in a customized convertible. JFK was with his wife, Jackie Kennedy, by his side in the back seat. In front of them was Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife, with two Secret Service agents Bill Greer driving and Roy Kellerman in the front. They left Love Field at about 1140 for their trip through Dallas. Traveling on Main Street, the streets were filled with excitement waiting to see the president. It was estimated that 200,000 people lined the roughly 10-mile route to the trademark. The president and his wife smiling and waving at the joyous sight. The motorcade turns off Main Street onto Dealey Plaza. The governor's wife, Nellie Connolly, turned back to Kennedy and commented, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Kennedy's reply, No. You certainly can't. These were his last words. 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, while driving past a Texas school depository, through the cheers of admiration, suddenly, sounds of gunshots filled the air. Startling the crowd, some just thought were sounds of firecrackers or possibly an engine backfiring. This is when President Kennedy is seen grabbing his chest and neck leaning forward. According to the Warren Report and what we learn in history, a bullet pierced the base of JFK's neck and exited through his throat, and then passed through Governor Connolly's shoulder, wrist, and then into his thigh. And this is what became known as the single bullet theory, or as I would call the magic bullet. (laughs) Just defying gravity. (laughs) After Connolly was hit, he shouted, Oh, no, 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 my God, they're going to kill us all. Jackie Kennedy, startled, holding her husband's arm, trying to comprehend what's happening before her eyes. As JFK begins to lean over onto Jackie, there's a third and fatal shot to the back of President Kennedy's head as they're passing the grassy knoll. Jackie is seen immediately reaching to the back of the car to collect pieces of her beloved husband that have been splattered. At the same time, this is where you can see Secret Service Special Agent Clint Hill running forward onto the trunk to shield them seconds after hearing the fatal shot. All three of these shots happen within seconds. The motorcade rushed to the nearby Parkland Memorial Hospital, which is, if you look it up, approximately eight minutes away. This is all truly horrifying from Jackie's perspective. She says that she blacked out and didn't even yeah. remember reaching to the back of the car. Which is probably, I think, that's the saddest it's part of it all. gut-wrenching. Yeah. On the way to the hospital, Mrs. Connolly, she remembered Jackie just sitting in the back repeating, They killed my husband. I have his brains in my hand. Because that's why she was, like, reaching into the, yeah, or in the trunk. She's skull matter. and brain matter. And all that Jackie could recall from this, uh, she made a statement. All the ride to the hospital, I kept bending over him saying, Jack, Jack, can you hear me? I love you, Jack. I kept holding the top of his head down, trying to keep his brains in. Like, that's just unimaginable. Trying to piece your husband together in your arms. So sad. And needless to say, no matter how quickly they arrived, the doctor's efforts were futile. There was nothing they could really do. JFK's personal physician, George Berkeley, arrived at Parkland five minutes after they had arrived, but 
there was just no way that he was going to be able to recover. JFK was officially declared dead at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time and was administered his last rites. JFK's death certificate, written by his physician, stated cause of death as gunshot wound to the skull. Governor Connolly was seriously injured, but was able to survive his injuries. Doctors later stated that after the governor was shot, his wife pulled him onto her lap. The way that he was pulled over helped close his front chest wound, which was causing air to be sucked in directly into his chest around his collapsed right lung. Wow. It's like, well, fucking lucky. Right? Well, there is a, another lucky or unlucky guy. There was a bystander, James Tag, Tog, that only had a minor cut to his right cheek when a bullet or like a fragment hit the curb. Ooh. He later stated to the Warren Commission that he remembered it was after hearing the second shot and was kind of trying to comply with the commission under such pressure, but later had questioned yeah. the Warren Commission and his standings and became very involved in researching conspiracy theories around the JFK assassination. After JFK was declared dead, members of his security detail were trying to remove his body from the hospital and got into an altercation with Dallas officials, including Dallas County Coroner Earl Rose, who felt he was legally obligated to perform an autopsy before JFK's body was removed. It got turned over to the Justice of the Peace to determine the cause of death and determine if an autopsy was going to be needed. Hence, a second certificate of death was made. JFK's autopsy was performed at Bethesda Naval Hospital upon Jackie's request due to his time as a officer in World War II. And this took place about 8 p.m. to midnight, approximately, mm -hmm. on November 22nd. Shortly after 2 p.m., JFK's body was taken from Parkland Hospital to Love Field. His casket was loaded into the rear of the passenger compartment of Air Force One in place of a removed row of seats on the plane. Vice President LBJ was in Dallas with JFK, merely two cars behind him in the motorcade, unscratched by the events. At 2.38 p.m., LBJ was administered the oath of office by federal judge Sarah T. Hughes aboard Air Force One before departing to Washington, with Jacqueline Kennedy by his side, still wearing her blood-splattered clothes on the plane with her slain husband. If you're wondering... Wow, how did LBJ feel about all of this? The president being assassinated that he's been working side by side with. I feel it's best described by his own words. He said, I became president, but for millions of Americans, I was still illegitimate. A naked man with no presidential covering. A pretender to the throne. An illegal usurper. Seemingly unaffected by the events... LBJ worried immediately about his legitimacy and claim to power, which is kind of fucked up. Yeah. As the motorcade left Dealey Plaza to Parkland Hospital, police officers and spectator and spectators, police officers and spectators ran up the grassy hill and from the triple underpass to the area behind a five-foot-high stockade fence atop the knoll. No sniper was found there. Meanwhile. A witness, Howard Brennan, sitting across the street from the Texas School Book Depository, told the police that as the motorcade was passing, he heard the shots come from above and saw a man with a rifle take the second shot from the sixth floor corner window. The same man that he saw sitting at the window minutes earlier. Employees from the depository reported hearing gun shots come from over their heads. They heard the gunshots and then cartridges dropping onto the floor. The Dallas police sealed off the exits from the depository between 12.30 to 12.50 p.m. An employee came forward saying that he saw Lee Harvey Oswald carrying a brown paper bag into the building that carried curtain rods. This brown bag was found by the police officers by the sixth floor window. After Oswald's supervisor reported him missing, the police put out a broadcast with his description as suspect to the shooting. Around 1.15 p.m., police officer Tippett spotted Oswald walking down the street with the matching description. 
in the neighborhood of Oak Cliff, just three miles away from Dealey Plaza. After stopping Oswald and exchanging a few words, the officer tried to get out of his car when Oswald shot him four times, killing him on sight, and then Oswald had fled the scene. Oswald was reported to be seen sneaking into a Texas theater without paying. The theater called the police at approximately 1.40 p.m. Officers shortly after arrived and arrested Oswald in the theater. They stated Oswald had resisted arrest and tried to draw his gun when he was hit and restrained. Lee Harvey Oswald was being charged with murders of JFK and Officer Tippett. He had denied shooting anyone and claimed that he was being made a patsy because he had previously lived in the Soviet Union. On Sunday, November 24th at 11.21 a.m., as Oswald was being escorted into a car in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters for the transfer from a city jail to a county jail, he was fatally shot by Dallas nightclub owner Jack Ruby. The shooting was broadcast live on American television. Unconscious Oswald was taken by ambulance to Parkland Memorial Hospital, where Kennedy had died just two days prior. He died at 1.07 p.m. by gunshot wound to the chest. Arrested immediately after the shooting, Jack Ruby said that he had been distraught by Kennedy's death and that killing Oswald would spare Mrs. Kennedy from the discomfiture of being brought back to trial. Now, the full dynamic of who Lee Harvey Oswald was and his relations to the CIA, I'm not going to go into the full story of who he is right now just yet because his past and questionable relations is related to a majority of the conspiracies related to the JFK assassination that we'll be covering in part two. If I didn't tell you already, or if you didn't read the title, this is a two-parter. But one thing I will say is if you think Jack Ruby done this out of being a patriotic citizen as a duty to his country and goodness of his little pea pick and heart, <laughs> You are sorely mistaken. Sorely. It's highly unlikely he had a history of being a common criminal, evidence of illegal gambling, narcotics, prostitution, and working with organized crime figures. Plus, how did he even get access to the location where Lee Harvey Oswald was? Because he was being escorted. Mm -hmm. If everyone in the area had to have proof of identification as a reporter or a doctor... I'm just going to stop myself here. (laughs) How the hell? How? Kennedy's body was flown back to Washington, D.C. and placed in a flag-draped casket in the East Room of the White House for 24 hours. On November 25th, a morning country watched on television as a somber parade conveyed the casket, carried on a caisson pulled by six horses, accompanied by a seventh riderless horse. Through the streets of Washington, D.C. to St. Matthew's Cathedral, site of the funeral mass, Kennedy was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. On November 29, 1963, President LBJ established the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, known unofficially as the Warren Commission, to investigate the assassination of JFK. It was ultimately put together to combat speculation of a conspiracy and that the results should be made publicly. Its 888-page final report was presented to LBJ on September 24th of 1964 and made public three days later. It concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone killing Kennedy and wounding Connolly, and that Jack Ruby acted alone in killing Oswald. So... If this was an inside job, then it would make sense why they would have a commission of people in the know of the real events to elude the public from the truth, is my thoughts on it. One of the most important pieces of evidence was a silent 8mm colored motion picture captured by Abraham Zapruder that was just shooting a home video of the parade when he captured the full sequence of JFK's assassination. This wasn't the only film reviewed from that day, but it was the most complete one, giving a clear view from a somewhat elevated position on the side from which the president's fatal wound shot was visible. The CIA had watched this recording and made copies the evening of November 23rd into the morning of the 24th. Some see this film as proof of a conspiracy 
while others feel it was a sophisticated forgery that was edited to remove the portion of the film containing a valuable yet gruesome evidence of the spray or cloud of matter that was JFK, which would either prove or disprove all the shots coming from behind When the Zapruder film aired on Goodnight America on March 6, 1975, it caused for a public uproar, many believing it was proof of a conspiracy. Because if the president was being shot at from behind, he would have been propelled forward. But instead, in the Zapruder film, it appears that JFK shifts back and to the left, as if he was struck from a forward position Mm -hmm. and we'll be sharing the film so that you guys have a link to it um even if you just youtube zapruder film it'll it'll come up but anyways this contributed to the church committee investigation on intelligence activities by the united states and resulted in the house select committee on assassinations investigations their results told a different story from the initial investigation This investigation concluded that the committee believes on a basis of the evidence available to it that Kennedy was probably assassinated as a result of conspiracy. The committee was unable to identify the other gunmen or the extent of the conspiracy. Now, when looking at the prime suspects to this conspiracy, the committee believes on the basis of evidence available That the Soviet government, the Cuban government, the Secret Service, FBI, CIA, were not involved in the assassination of JFK. But when it comes to organized crime group or anti-Castro Cuban groups, that they were not involved, but the available evidence does not preclude the possibility that individual members may have been involved from these groups. So, on this note is where I shall leave you. I wanted to focus this episode on his rise to power, what tensions were ongoing during his presidency, because, like, one feel I I feel often gets lost in translation. It was more than just an interesting conspiracy theory. People lose sight of the fact why American people as a whole were so impacted the day JFK was shot. To them, he was an American hero and represented dreams of a bright future. And that's the reason why they want and need answers. And what is taught in high school history class doesn't necessarily reflect all of the facts or the questionable elements revolving around his assassination. In part two, we're going to go through the discrepancies on the case, his autopsy report, the logistics of the gunshots, Lee Harvey Oswald claims and his past, and his subsequent assassination and the different theories of who was behind the gun that day, and why. So, I hope this left you hungry for more. If you have some spicy conspiracy theories on this case, Renee, where can they go? Well, they can go to their email. (laughs) Their (laughs) own email? And pull up a compose, (laughs) an email, and, and type in to the recipient address the creepy burrito at gmail.com and send us a little email there about what they think is going to be covered in next week's episode part two of jfk's conspiracy theories yeah, yeah. 10 out of 10 do it yeah uh you can also hit us up on instagram facebook you can tweet at us and we'll try to figure it out for you maybe we'll probably ignore it and if you love the creepy burrito tell the creepy burrito by leaving your sweet-ass reviews on iTunes, Stitcher, Podchaser, CastBox, or rating us on your streaming apps. Yeah. And and on that note, because Renee is super sleepy. I'm very tired. I bored her to death with history. (sighs) Killing her with history. Dude, isn't it weird to think that... History classes are just going to get longer and harder as time goes on. Right? I thought about that before, yeah. but I think I was a stoner in high school, like, thinking about, like, how history never ends. But then, eventually, history will just wash away because, like, how many parts of history did we lose out on because the stone plates were gone? 
<laughs> they didn't stand the test of time. They didn't stand a chance. Or libraries that were burned down. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know. Ancient. Alexandria. Yeah. Ancient bibliotecas. Gan. Ganzo. Ganzo. So what happens if the internet goes out? What if we have an apocalypse and then no one has any sort of history of us anymore? Well. The creepy burrito will still be there. Standing the test of time. Yes. Forever podcasting. Forever creepy. Mm. And on that note, <laughs> mm, bye. Bye bye. Mm, goodbye now. Mm, Till next week. Mm, come back, get lost in that thought with us. <laughs>